Welcome everyone. My name is Chelsea Kennedy and I am the communications lead at Kids and Company. Thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. We are so excited to collaborate with Toronto Kids Physio to provide insight for families on gross motor milestones and the development of play skills. Today's webinar is hosted by Kasha Pika. She is a registered pediatric physiotherapist at Toronto Kids Physio, a private physiotherapy clinic designed exclusively for children. Kasha treats infants to teens for anything from sports injuries to physical and developmental disabilities and concussions. If you have any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will ensure they get addressed at the end of the session. Over to you, Kasha. Thanks so much, Kelsey. I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. Thank you guys again for having me at Kids and Co. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about growth motor milestones. So like Kelsey had mentioned, we're just going to be chit-chatting a little bit about growth motor skills and then the, de the development story of play for the ages of about 12 months or a year to about five years old. So I'll quickly go over a couple of today's objectives. We'll discuss what the role of a physio actually is in terms of gross motor skills and then the development of play skills. We'll go over what the emerging skills should be. And we've kind of broken it down in terms of toddlers, so one to three, and then preschooler type of age, so four and five years old. So we'll go over those skills and then kind of discuss how you guys can promote some of those skills at home through a couple of ideas. And lastly, because as a physio, not only do I treat, but I also educate quite a bit, we'll go over a bunch of the common topics or Q&As that I get asked tons during my day. Typically for this age group, the most common things I get asked about or uh, we talk about is footwear and foot positioning, different types of ways that the feet can look, and then in regards to that, trips and falls. So despite having a very nice introduction, I always like giving a little bit of a debrief in terms of who I am and what I do. So as Kelsey mentioned, my name is Kasha. I'm a pediatric physiotherapist, and I actually work out of Toronto Kids Physio, which we have two locations. Our first location that opened up was in Midtown, which is at Young and Lawrence. And then our second location opened up this past summer in Leaside, kind of Eglinton and Laird area. I always make this running joke that my job, even though it's a physiotherapist, what I do all day long is play. And as funny as that may sound to a lot of people, it truly is what I do, uh, depending on whether the kid is an infant, a preschooler, a teen. What we do in physio is we try to mask exercises through hip play. That's how kids learn. But also, if you can think about it, how am I going to get a three-year-old doing squats or bridges by me just showing them what to do? We mask it through play. So outside of it may look like a fun session, we are really working towards goals and their milestones. So I'll kind of go over what my role is and what we do here at Kids Physio in general. So in terms of our clinic, Kids Physio is just for kids and just physio. And the reason why we did this was there are tons of physio clinics out there for you as parents. If you've ever had an injury or have known someone who has had to use physio, you most likely will go to a typical physio clinic that's based for adults whether it's for young adults, a little bit older, but what we do is uh, primarily just for kids. We only see infants upwards of 18 years of age. And the reason for that is we have the specific equipment that we need, we have the specific toys that we need. And because of that, we also just do physio. There are multidisciplinary clinics in and around the area, wherever you guys are from, whether that's in Canada or Ontario, even in the States but we really focus in on physio because that's what we do best and that's what we want to make sure everyone is getting from our sessions, the best possible care. So in terms of the type of kids that we might see or the type of things that we might be able to get referrals for, we see typically developing kiddos, we see atypical development in the sense of, oh, my apologies, I'm in a room where my lighting can turn off. Um, atypical development in the sense of delayed skills, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, any kiddos that might have any physical cognitive disabilities, injuries, and the list goes on. But another main point that we do do a lot of in our sessions is education, whether that's educating parents on how to play with their kids, educating about injury prevention, concussions, or even about pelvic health. 
at our specific locations, we do have a pelvic physio on staff that works with little ones for toileting or for constipation issues. So from a more global perspective, what does a pediatric physio do? Like I mentioned, our clinics, we see infancy upwards of 18 years of age. But in general, pediatric physios, a lot of what we do is motor milestone checkups. So whether that's your little one is three months old, whether your little one is four years old, parents will come in just to have a brief check-in they've either noticed based on other friends or even nieces and nephews. They just look like they're struggling with some of their movements or they might be behind a skill. A lot of families will come in on that. And what we do from a physio perspective, we look at all different types of skills, but we're also challenging them in terms of their balance, coordination, and endurance. Because a lot of times a kid may look like they're doing the skill correctly, but they are the greatest compensators in the world, whether that's being silly, whether that's using other muscles. So we want to challenge them in different ways to really figure out, hmm, why might they be a little bit delayed? Other big things that we see at pediatric physios is any sort of alignment issues. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of the next three points, in-towing, out-towing, toe-walking, and flat feet. But everything has to do with alignment, and we'll kind of go over how most of this stuff is pretty typical to see, and when does it become atypical. But a lot of toes might turn inward, so in-towing, toes out like a little bit of a duck, walking on tippy toes, or feet flat, so you might notice those ankles rolling in. In terms of my presentation for today and why we might be having conversations about gross motor skills for one to five-year-olds, a big part of what I see, not only with the motor milestone check-ins, is parents will come in and say, I think my little one might be a little bit delayed. However, I'm not sure. The only thing I notice is they seem a little bit different or they're not keeping up with their peers which is a big role when it comes to starting preschool, starting daycare. You might not have ever had your little one in a social environment, or you might not have other siblings or nieces and nephews around. So you might not know what typical development looks like. And then you come into a kids and co facility and you're like, my little one just looks like they're struggling a little bit. So it's very normal for parents to have this kind of um, reason for coming in to see a physio. And that's what we do best, being able to bring your kiddos up to the level that they need to be. Like I mentioned, we're gonna be chatting about the different skills and emerging skills, and I've broken it down into toddlers, so one to three, and then we'll talk about preschoolers a little bit um, in a couple of slides. So for the one to three-year-olds, I always like to have the conversation of, what were they doing in babyhood? So whenever we're talking to families about their toddlers, so those one to three-year-olds, we always want to take a look at what was your kiddo doing before this time? So zero to 12 months. And the reason for this is those are the months that they were developing early skills that they're going to need to continue to use and refine as they're moving forward. So I've listed a couple of here, for example, rolling, crawling, sitting independently, pulling to stand. And what we're trying to look at from a physio perspective when we're asking these questions is, well, was your child rolling early? If so, great. If they weren't, we were looking to see whether there's things that might have been delayed. So if, for example, they were a late roller or they were a late crawler, some things that might be a little bit weaker or underdeveloped might be their tummy muscles or those core muscles or their bum cheek muscles that I used to always call or the glute muscles. So we always want to go back in time to see where your kiddo was because sometimes if we do notice any delays or things that might look a little bit different, we always want to go backwards in time because those first 12 months are so important to develop the skills that they need, but also the muscles that they'll need to refine as they grow older. So any missed milestones can lead to muscle dysfunction or can affect more advanced skills later on. So sometimes your kiddo might have been rolling or doing a certain skill, but was only doing it over one side. So future skills might have been a little bit more delayed or in general, they were delayed um, to begin with. I always preface, and you'll notice throughout my presentation, I'll give kind of these big um, teaching moments or these things that you're going to take out of the presentation. So despite you might be thinking about your little one throughout this presentation, you'd be like, ah, no, they're not where they need to be at this age group. It is totally fine for a kiddo to be delayed. That's why we're here to help. But the big thing to note, especially for zero to 12 months, I always say you want your little one to be advancing every two to four weeks. 
whether that's a new skill or they're getting better at a skill, that's the thing we're looking for. So they might start rolling within four weeks or they might not progress in a skill, but they might be rolling more frequently. So when we get to toddlerhood, we talk about this in terms of every one to two months. They should be getting better at something or they should be gaining a new skill every few months. And the reason for that is they're gaining confidence, they're gaining strength. They can't really be changing every two to four weeks. So we give them a little bit of time. But so long as your kiddo is making improvements every one to two months, that is totally okay, even if you might be going through this presentation and being like, ah, my little one seems a little bit off. Totally okay. So the months of 12 months or one year to three years old is a huge range. But the biggest thing that we always want to encourage and discuss is your kiddo is going to be exploring a ton. Not only does this have to be physically exploring their environment, so they might be climbing up structures, they might be going to a playground that they've never been to and figuring out how to use their body, but they're also cognitively exploring. How do I get from this surface to that surface? How do I engage with that surface? How do I get there? They're thinking through lots of different things. And through that cognitive process, they're really learning a lot about their bodies. They're learning about body awareness, body exploration, Another big word you might hear is proprioception, where their arms or their legs or their body are in space. And this all has an impact on coordination. One of the take home messages that I always like to say is exploration is key. As much as we want to keep our little ones safe, we wanna make sure that they're not hurting themselves. We do want to foster an environment where you allow them to obviously explore their environment within reason and within safety. I'm not saying take your kids out on an icy playground to make sure they can trip and fall all over the place, but you do want to allow them to kind of go from unstable surfaces. So from the rocks in the playground to grass, you want to give them that exploration because that is huge for those um, one year to three years old. Other things that happen as they explore, they learn new skills, running, jumping, balancing on one foot. It's obviously really fun as parents and as physios to see your kid be doing something completely new that you've never taught them. Totally okay if you need to teach them how to do something, but this is a time in their lives where they're figuring out how their bodies work, and so they're going to be exploring and advancing their skills. So as they're develop developing all of these skills, it's important to establish good patterns of movement and making sure that things are symmetric in order to enable them to play and participate. What I mean by that is, I kind of mentioned it in the last slide, if your little one has been rolling but only rolled over one side, they might be um, forming some form of dominance. So they might only use that right side of the body a little bit more than the left. So when we talk about good patterns of movement, we want symmetry on both sides and we don't want to see any form of dominance on either leg or hand up until the age of three. So let's get into the skills. So I've broken it up into skills and then I've kind of gone into chunks. So 18 to two years old and two to three years old. And the reason for that is, I mentioned early on, from zero to 12 months, we should be gaining new skills every two to four weeks. Once your little one starts walking, which happens anywhere from 12 months to 18 months of age, that's completely normal. Within that time frame, the first two to three months that they start walking, they're really just figuring out how to walk, whether that's walking for longer periods of time, whether that's walking across different surfaces. So for the first between 12 to 15 months or 15 to 18 months, whenever they start walking, those first three months, they're really just figuring out their confidence and balance. So the newer skills tend to happen closer to about 18 months of age, or 18 months of age, sorry. So between 18 months to two years old, when we're talking about stairs, there's really two things, going upstairs and going downstairs. Going up the stairs, we would envision our little ones being able to walk up the stairs with a handrail, but in a step two pattern. So for you and I, we walk with one foot on each step, so alternating or reciprocal. For little ones at this age, step two would mean they lift one foot up and they place the other foot to meet it or to step two. So that's what's going to be happening for 18 to two years old on the way up. On the way down, we would envision them crawling, crawling backwards is what you want to be um, encouraging, not crawling forward, safety concern, but you also might get a daredevil on your hands that wants to just slide down the stairs if you allow them to crawl forward. So you always want them to crawl backwards. Once they hit the age of about two, 
up to the age of three years old, things start to change, especially going down the stairs. They will descend the stairs doing that step two pattern. So one foot leaps and the other foot leaps by holding on a handrail. And going up, things have also changed. Now they're still using handrail. However, they're doing that more adult type of movement where they place one foot on each step. So not two feet on one step, but one foot on each step and reciprocally crawling or sorry, walking up the stairs. The next couple of big skills that happen are single leg balance and jumping. So single leg balance, I always say, is a pretty silly one um, for us to discuss or observe. And the way I always tell families to kind of think about single leg balance is if you're helping your little one put their shoe on, are they able to stand, lift one foot and put it into the shoe without holding on to you or without holding on to a wall? So that's what we would notice for the two to three year old where they're able to hold their foot up for one to two seconds to put their foot into a shoe. For the earlier age group, the 18 months to two years old, they may attempt to lift up their foot. They might sometimes, you know, lift their foot up for a, a little bit of time to stomp something or even going up the stairs, you might notice they don't wanna use a handrail, but they'll lift one foot up. So it's a very momentary type of skill that we're seeing at that age. Jumping is one of my favorite skills to teach, one of my favorite skills to see, because it is so rewarding for our little ones. So for 18 months to two years old, we don't really see much jumping. And when we talk about jumping, I want to preface it is jumping um, with two feet. So pushing off with two feet and landing with two feet at the same time. For 18 months to about two years of age, we might see a stagger jump where they kind of gallop or hop forward. One foot might lift off the floor, the other foot kind of drags. So it's a little bit of a staggered position and they're not really lifting both feet up into the air. By the time they're about two, upwards of three, that's when they're starting to gain the skill of jumping. And the big thing to note, there's three different types of jumps we're looking for. Jumping forward, jumping up in the air, and then down. Typically, jumping down happens first. If you have a little one that's a daredevil, you might notice that they'll jump off from the last step of your staircase or they're on the couch, they're wanting to jump down. It's just a little bit easier for kids to do, whereas jumping up into the air and jumping forward takes a lot more strength and stability. So be mindful of the fact, if you notice that your kid has started to jump down, totally fine, the next couple up and forward will take a little bit of time. So the last two types of skills I always preface have to deal with whether they've been exposed to balls. So catching and throwing are big skills that we do look for. However, in the back of my, our minds as physios, we're always thinking about, we're asking the question, has your little one ever played with the ball? A lot of times families will be like, no, I don't have a ball at home or I didn't think that they could use one. Or you know what? Yeah, I saw them toss a stuffed animal, but we don't really practice that. So this is an area where sometimes they do see delays and it's not something that I'm overly concerned about unless there's delays in other areas as well. I'm always mindful of the fact that not everyone is either athletic or thinks to play with their kiddo with balls. So it's totally fine if any of these skills are a little bit delayed. And when we talk about catching skills, 18 months to two years old, they're really not catching much. They're just gonna present their arms out ready to catch. They might close their eyes. They might move to the side. They might duck. That's kind of what I see. Um, typically, if you're throwing something up in the air, a lot scarier, I will sometimes look at catching from the sense of a rolling perspective. Can they catch a ball that's rolling towards them? Those are early skills that we're looking for. When we go upwards in age to two to, two to three years old, we're really looking for, can they get their arms ready and can they trap that ball against your body? I'm not looking for them to catch a ball with only their hands. So if you think about a tennis ball, not looking for them to catch a small object, looking for them to catch a larger object and trapping it against their body. So typically, if this is something that you're thinking about that you haven't really practiced with your kiddos, um, a good way to encourage this, and we'll talk a little bit more about promoting play in a bit, but getting larger uh, animals or larger balls to trap against your body are a good way to start. Throwing, same thing that I discussed with catching. Not much happens for 18 months to two years old. They might start swinging things. Um, a lot of times the skill actually starts way earlier. Um, 10 months, 12 months, you might notice that you give your little baby a toy and they just huck it or chuck it across the room. So by 18 months to two years old, you might start noticing that they might start just lifting up their hands, but they're not really turning and rotating their body as much. So 
to think of a pitcher in baseball. They don't have that proper form. By the time they're two to three, they're just using their arm to throw and not really using their trunk as much, but their feet remain in place and they're not losing their balance when they're thrown. So those are the major skills that emerge for a toddler. So I'll just quickly go back, stairs, single leg balance, jumping, and then catching and throwing skills. So you might be wondering, great, Kasha, thank you so much for educating me on this. How do we promote it? And what are other things that you need to be thinking about? So you might be thinking about, okay, well, my kid has done some of these, or it looks like they're trying to do it, but they're two years old and they seem like they're only up to 18 months. Like I mentioned previously, so long as your little one is progressing every one to two months and is doing either something new or with more confidence, with more ease, that's okay. Kids typically track what, how they were doing previously. So what I mean, they might have been really early on um, as babies tracking really quickly. So at six months, they're already sitting and maybe kneeling, whereas typically that should happen closer to nine. So if they're tracking early, they're going to continue to track early. If they're tracking on time, they're continuing to track on time. And if they were a little bit late or delayed on some skills, then that same pattern moves forward. It is very, very, very infrequent that we see a regression in skills. And why I bring that up is I have a conversation with families a lot where they'll be like, yeah, my kid was doing something, but last week they stopped doing it all of a sudden. A week's time is not really a delay. And typically if you notice that within a week, but then they start doing something maybe a week or two later, totally fine. What typically is probably happening is they've gone through a growth spurt. So the bones of the body typically go faster than the muscles do. So the muscles kind of go into a tighter um, position because they haven't been stretched out yet. They haven't been used to their full capacity. So sometimes it might look like your kid isn't doing what they were previously doing, but they have a longer and bigger body. And now they have to figure out, well, how do I balance now? I have so much more length. I have so much more uh, possibility of falling because I'm taller. So confidence is something that they need to regain, being able to figure out how to control their bodies. So a week or two is totally fine. Every kid will continue to track as they did, whether they were early, on time, or late. They continue to follow that same progression. As I mentioned, we always want to make sure that things are symmetric. So we want to be encouraging things on the left side and on the right side. There should be no dominance or discrepancy in strength from one side, especially upwards uh, of three years of age. So typically by the time they start using utensils, going to school more often using uh, pens and papers, there shouldn't be any hand dominance, definitely no foot dominance. As they grow older, they'll be able to start kicking and balancing better on one foot than the other, just like you and I, we have a more dominant side. If your little one has skipped or missed any of those babyhood milestones, so never crawled, never did things um, like rolling or wasn't consistent, then you might notice some of these skills might be a little bit troublesome but that's why you guys are in on this talk today. If you need any help, a pediatric physio is who you would be. And like I'd already mentioned, uh, mentioned, sorry, we all learn through exposure. So if they've never picked up a ball, not expecting them to have that milestone. So that's why it's so key that you allow your little ones to explore. Obviously, you can't think of every single thing that your kids should play with, but being able to play with other kids, going to a playground, going to different areas, hikes, playgrounds, um, different surfaces at home, carpets, hardwood, stairs, just let them explore. And so now we've gone through everything, let's talk about how do you actually promote this with your little ones. So you guys are the ones that are gonna be able to support their development, but the best way you guys can do that is by being just active and letting them explore. So kids learn through problem solving, they learn through being able to be given an opportunity and see what they do. Obviously, like I mentioned, within reason, I don't want you guys going out and throwing your little ones on ice and saying, figure it out. But we want to be able to allow them to trip and fall. It is very normal and common for that to happen, especially in a toddler's age. Um, and the biggest thing is we want them to learn. Well, if they did it once or twice and they fell on the ice, they're going to figure out next time that they're either going to have to go slower on the ice or they're going to have to brace their muscles a little bit more. But the only way they can learn that is by doing that repeatedly and exploring their environment. Go out to playgrounds, go out to parks. Obviously, at this age, you're more than welcome to put them into different programs like swimming, gymnastics. They're not really doing um, anything in terms of skill development, but they're doing things in terms of ex 
exploration and allowing them to explore in their environment. So in gymnastics, they are not working on somersaulting skills. They're not working on their jumping skills necessarily, but they're giving them an environment where these things might be able to come out in their in your little ones, or they're just developing that type of environment for them. So other big things, climbing is a huge one. Um, climbing ladders, climbing stairs, climbing fences, <laughs> climbing trees. I always laugh when I say this because I, I don't know if any of you were here for the previous part of this, but I was telling Kelsey, I can't see you guys on my screen because I'm a Chromebook user. Um, but anytime I do presentations that I can see it because I'm using a MacBook, parents are always like, oh my God, please no, I don't want them to be climbing fences and trees. I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just saying climbing is a great way to do it. If you have a pickler at home, if you have any form of a ramp that they can climb up, a slide, those are other big things. But if you allow them to, and you guys are one of those parents that wants to let them see what they can do, climbing is great. The last thing I always say, make it into a game. If you have siblings, um, you can say, who can stand on their foot the longest? Who can crawl up the stairs the quickest? Who can jump the furthest? So. If you're able to have somebody that is a little bit older, kids learn by exploring, but also by socializing and seeing. So it's a great way to obviously have your kiddos learn new skills by seeing other things. I gave a couple of ideas in terms of different types of games that you can make. So for toppers, they're really big on pretend play. So pretending to be different types of animals, depending, um, pretending to be different types of careers. So I, a lot of times, will have pizza makers come in to sit here with me. I have cashiers that work at Loblaws. So they are little toddlers who are coming in and putting in coins into my practice um, cashier machine, and they're bringing me groceries. Or I will tell them that they are a bear and they have to walk in a certain way. So I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. But these are more meant to give you guys ideas in terms of fun ways to engage with the kids. Like I said previously, my job is to play all day. I'm not going to ask a kid to do five squats, 10 glute bridges, um, what else can I think about, single leg hops. They just don't know what you're asking. And obviously, it's not fun for them to do. So why would they do what I'm asking them to do? So we do a lot of things through play. And that's the best way kids can learn. That's why going into Kids & Co is great. When you're socializing your kids, they're going to be silly. They're going to be with their friends saying like, hey, did you know how a frog jumps? And they might show their kids. Um, the other kid what to do. So they learn through exposure from other kids, but also through play. Bear walking, flamingo spins, frog jumps, crab walks, make it into a game. Make it into a game where they're a bear and you hide some food if you have groceries at home because bears hibernate in the wintertime. All of these things are very fun ways. Again, I am not saying you have to be the most creative parent in the world. Google is your best friend for this. Um, there's lots of great ideas if you literally just Google animal exercises, kids. The amount of times I've gone on there, if I've been trading for the full day and my brain is not working, it's astronomical how great Google is. So here are a couple of ideas that you guys can promote skills or play. Awesome. Now we're moving into the skills of a three to five-year-old or those preschooler type kiddos. So like I mentioned from the toddler phase, we're always looking back to babyhood. Same thing is happening when we're talking about our preschoolers. What did they do in toddlerhood? So it's a big transition to go from a one to three-year-old who might never have been to daycare and then transitioning into a pre-K or a daycare-based school where they're now learning lots of different structures um, in terms of now they have play structures at school and now they have to sit for longer periods of time. Now they actually have to listen. So outside of the physical aspect of things, they're really having to learn that their bodies need to stop for periods of time. They have to be aware of their uh, surroundings. There's going to be things behind them, in front of them, chairs, desks, all of these new things, not to include all the new surfaces that they're going to be engaging with. So toddlerhood, that's why we talk a lot about exposure, because once they get to preschool, we want them to be able to deal with any new types of surfaces that they might have not been exposed to or at least show them that there's lots of different surfaces and ways that their body needs to interact with them. So as kiddos, they just need to learn to adjust their bodies and to be able to balance in order to prevent falls. So that's what's kind of happening in preschool age. In toddlerhood, 
they're running into things, they're crashing into things, whether it's purposeful or not. But now kids are really learning about body awareness quite a bit to prevent those falls. But they're also going to be learning not only how to use their bodies from the skill perspective, but we're also moving towards more fundamental movements or functional skills. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of uh, seconds, but we're going to be talking about stationary skills, locomotion skills, and manipulative. So before I was talking about stairs, jumping, all that kind of stuff. As we move into preschool age three, four, five, the way we talk about their skills kind of changes in order to talk about more static skills, movement skills, and how they're able to manipulate objects. So just in case someone was questioning the um, terminology here. So fundamental skills, which if any of you have read the blog post that we actually um, did for Kids & Co, we talked a lot about this for our transitioning towards kindergarten. Um, so we talked about stationary skills being movements that are performed on the spot. So your body's not moving. So things like balancing on one foot, standing and bending forward to pick something up, twisting. Feet stay in one spot, but the upper body might move. Then we talk about locomotion, so how their body moves as they travel across the floor. Rolling, jumping, hopping, running, all that good stuff. Last um, skill is, or a fundamental skill is manipulative. So those ball skills that we talked about. Throwing things, being able to kick things now, being able to catch, being able to strike, so baseball bats or hitting something. Those are the three big things that we're going to be talking about now. So when we're talking about all of those, we want to be making sure, oh, I apologize. I didn't actually speak about these. I thought I had another slide. I apologize. So when we're talking about these age groups, when we're talking about three to five-year-olds, there really isn't too, too much difference in terms of the different skills. So that's probably the reason why I didn't have this on my slide. Everything is time-based. So what I mean by that, when we're talking about stationary skills, being able to stand on one foot, we talked about for the toddlerhood, one to two seconds. When we're going to three to four and four to five, the only big difference is how long. So typically for the three to four-year-old, we're doing about three to five seconds now. Once we get to four to five, we're going anywhere closer to five to 10 seconds. And again, the biggest thing that I want to hone in here is that there should not be any dominance. So if your little one can stand on their right foot as a four-year-old for five seconds, I would expect the same to be on the left foot. They might wibble wobble their arms a little bit more, and that's okay. That shows there's a little bit of weakness, but it should be pretty symmetric in timing. When we're talking about any of the locomotion, we're not talking about time anymore. We're talking about distance. So when we're talking about being able to jump and hop, as they're three to four years old, they're maybe only jumping six inches, 12 inches. As we go to four to five year olds, we're now being able to jump further distances, not a full 24 inches all the time, but sometimes depending on the height of your kid, they can be jumping that much further. But again, the biggest thing that I always hone in on and tell people is look at how they're jumping. Are they jumping off with one foot first and landing with that foot? Because when we talked about jumping in the toddler section, we're talking that jumping is jumping off with two feet and landing with two feet. So here, the only difference is the distance between a three to four year old and four to five year old. In terms of manipulative skills, the only big difference is their kicking skill. So for a three to four year old, you might notice that their foot shuffles on the floor a little bit. They might start elevating that foot forward in order to kick an object, whereas a four to five year old, they're really going to be bringing that leg back, taking it off the floor and swinging it forward. And they're not really going to be losing balance as well. So for this, it's really just the dynamic of their movement. In terms of throwing and catching, distance is another big one as well. We obviously want as they get older to be able to throw things further, but also to throw things at target. So not a lot changes between three to five year olds outside of timing distance and how they're actually performing the skills. So we want them to get uh, better at how they're moving their body or the quality of movement. So when it comes to promoting skills in preschoolers, said it once, I'll say it 50 times, exploration is still key. So you still want to give your little ones the opportunity to move around. We've been always taught after school, you should be able to play outside. 
same thing happens for a preschooler. They should be able to move, move, move. But the nice part about this is you'll be able to start putting in, them into either sports specific activities or different types of programming outside of the typical gymnastics and swimming. They might start wanting to have an interest in skating. They might want to do some karate, some sports um, types of activities, hockey, soccer, all that kind of stuff. So now we're moving into an era where socialization is huge, but also having them learn how to participate with other kids. So I had mentioned that kids learn very well with socialization. So bringing them to daycare to kids and co is fantastic. But we also want them to be able to interact with their peers in a collaborative approach. So being able to do activities that they need to trust somebody else, to kick a ball to somebody. If that's not the case, you don't have that opportunity. There's still a lot of great ways that you can do things at home. So if you guys have siblings at home, you can put them through a bunch of different YouTube programs. Um, Cosmic Kids Yoga is a great one. If you ever have seen them online, they do yoga, but they do like fun activities that are more gymnastics based or animal based where they stand on one foot looking like a flamingo. So that's a good one to do at home. It's a great way if you have other kiddos around, cousins, have them do that in the basement as you're going to go make breakfast or dinner or whatnot so that they can be engaging in something. Obviously, with the era that we're in, virtual is huge. We don't want to be exposing our kids to lots of different types of screens because they might already be doing that if they're doing a hybrid approach. Will they okay? There's lots of things. You can put things on in the background all the time in the video here. I'll have an iPad, not because I want a kid to be doing a program, but I like for them to hear what's going on and then they're just mimicking me. So you can do that as well. There's lots of different programs on Peloton. They have some family-based ones, um, some music ones. So the key here is lots of exposure, but doing things together and doing things so that they can socialize. All right, so this, let me check my timing, great. Um, this section of my presentation is purely based on things that either you might be thinking of or I know I have had asked multiple, multiple times in a physio practice. So this kind of goes over the span of both toddlerhood and preschooler. So I have a lot of families that come to me asking about footwear, about my kid looks like they're flat footed. So I won't read through everything here. You guys are more than welcome to read through it. But the big take home messages, if we talk about footwear first, they should be barefoot at home as much as possible. Um, I know the thing right now is, well, it's cold outside. I want them to be in socks or they might get sick if they're going to have socks. Obviously, I will leave that decision up to you. From a physio perspective, we want them in bare feet because as you can see here, um, the back toes are actually curling on this little kiddo. We want them to be able to grip the floor, to feel what it's like from a sensory perspective, get those feet muscles moving, the intrinsic muscles of their feet. So barefoot is best at home. However, when we're bringing them to Kids & Co or to any other sort of activity, we also want to talk about footwear. So flexible and breathable is best. So what that means is we want a shoe that is very similar to a running shoe for you and I, where you're able to flex the sole. So it should be fairly flexible. However, the back of the shoe should not be collapsible. So the part around the heel shouldn't be mesh. It shouldn't be over collapsible. And the reason for that is we want a solid and rigid surface at the heel to keep that heel or that ankle in a proper position. And so with activities outside or even indoors, if you have to bring a pair to Kids & Co, you still want something a little bit rigid to make sure that that foot is in a proper position. And if we talk about flat feet, if your little one has flat feet, I still say barefoot is best, but in a properly fitted shoe where that um, ankle is supported, you're not going to be collapsing the foot. So what flat-footed means is when they're walking, the arches, as you can see a little bit in this little kill here, um, the arches are not um, elevated off of the floor. They're kind of collapsing inward. You can see some shadowing on that back foot. Even though that's the case here, we always say that the feet develop, especially upwards of the age of three in terms of developing an arch, but then definitely they complete being formed by nine to 10 years of age. So that's why barefoot is best. If we keep them in a shoe or if we keep them in socks, they're really not using their intrinsic foot muscles, which is what we want them to do in order to help develop those arches. If they have flat feet, it's probably a genetic portion as well. So that's 
still might be a factor after the age of nine or 10, they still have flat feet. But at least for the first kind of three to six years of their life, we want to make sure that they're working on those foot muscles. Because if you toss them into any form of orthotic or any sort of supportive shoe all the time, and they're not gaining those intrinsic foot muscles, then you're just not allowing them to develop that arch if they potentially could. In towing, so pigeon towing or feet coming inward, um, very, very common, especially in toddlers. You'll notice that their feet turn inward or their knees cave in. That is purely based on the um, growth spurt of little ones. That is based on their uh, mechanics and their bone development. It is totally normal. Typically, we say it develops or resolves, sorry, by five to eight years of age. I do see it quite early on. And when it becomes an issue that I would see it is if you notice in your little ones, they're frequently falling. You know, most of you are gonna ask, well, what is a frequent fall? If they're falling more compared to their peers is one way to think about it. Or if you're noticing when they're tripping and falling, they're dragging or tripping over their toes, that's an indication that they're tripping and falling too much. They should be able to um, lift their toes up Obviously, trips happen or they bump into things, but if they're all the time tripping over their toes because their toes are going inward and they're not lifting them up when they're walking or running, that's where the intoning becomes an issue. Or if you're noticing it has delayed their skills in the sense of within those one to two months that I had mentioned, they really haven't gained a new skill. All they're doing is falling and they're not really showing any confidence to want to do anything different. That's something that you would kind of look into a pediatric physio for. The other big thing is one foot turns in, so asymmetric presentation, or the biggest one, W sitting. I cannot do this on my own. I will try. Ooh, and the feet are on the outside of the bum cheeks. That is a very uncomfortable position for a majority of adults. For kids, so if your little one is a W sitter, they most likely will have in towing. So that's the time you would seek out a physio's help. So walking is another big one that uh, we will see or that we talk about and educate families on. So being able to go up onto your toes a few seconds is totally fine. Um, kids learn through their bodies. We're experiencing new positions. We wanna know what our bodies can do. They go up on their toes a few seconds, not a problem. However, when it is a problem is when you know, a kid does it all the time. They wake up and then the first three to four steps, their feet are flat. The rest of the time, they're up on those toes 70 to 80% of the time. Yeah, they can walk flat-footed a few steps, but it's majority of the time. So like I mentioned, it's very typical for kids to explore, especially in toddlerhood. But if they're doing this or the age of two, or they've been doing it greater than four to six months since they started walking, that is something you would want to seek out support for. Why we say we don't want to wait until kids grow out of this, because sometimes a lot of families say, well, yeah, my other kid did it, but our pediatrician said it was fine. For the most part, they will resolve on their own and they will outgrow it. However, why we don't want to wait and see is because there's different causes of the walking. Sometimes it could be that their muscles are actually tight and they can't go into a flat-footed position. So if you're waiting and seeing, that muscle is just continuing to get stronger and continue to be in this type of position where they go on their toes. But if you came in earlier and we gave you a couple stretches, you'd be able to identify that. Or you might notice that sometimes their base of support is moving forward, so it's affecting their balance in the sense of um, if they're always on their toes, they're leaning a little bit forward. The second you ask them to lean backwards, just flat, stand flat-footed, they're gonna be top laying backwards. You might notice a delay in their balancing skills. So that's a time we also don't want to wait and see. So there's lots of also causes for this, but also different types of interventions that we talk about. So we might give you a couple of stretches if muscles are tight, but it might also be your kid does not like the sensation of being flat-footed, which happens sometimes with our kiddos. So we'll give them ways to expose themselves to different types of services to prevent being on their toes. We talked about this briefly, uh, W sitting, but that's that position where the knees come inward and the feet go out. And this is a position that a lot of toddlers and preschoolers will um, assume. But so long as it's not their dominant position in the sense that they're not spending greater than 10 minutes at once in it, not a problem. However, when it becomes the dominant position, 
that's something we want to be aware of and kind of concerned about just because it puts their hips in an improper position. So then when they ne need to get out of that position and use the muscles on the outside of their bum cheeks, which don't work in a W sitting position, you might notice that their gait or their walking looks wonky. They might be flaring their feet when they're running because they're not used to using the proper muscles. And at the same time, being in that W position slouches their back and turns off those tummy muscles or core muscles. So any other um, growth motor skills that need the butt cheek muscles or the core muscles might be delayed. So ways to kind of correct that, please do not nag. You will be driving yourself insane. I do it in clinic from time to time being like, hey, do you notice that you're W sitting? But that's not the best way to alter that position. Kids naturally just fall into it. They don't really realize. So the best way to change that is to make their environment a little bit different. So place all their toys up above a surface so that they can sit on a stool in order to play. Place all their toys on a surface that they can kneel at. Have them sit on a couch cushion on the floor where you tell them to be crisscross. So you really want to change the environment rather than having them actually uh, or telling them every single time to change their positioning. And last but not least, trips and falls. So we kind of already talked about this in the sense that it is pretty common for toddlers, so that one to three year range, but how they're tripping is when it becomes a concern. So early walkers, it's totally fine, but once they become older and they start tripping over their toes because their muscles aren't working properly or their foot isn't lifting itself up, then that's when it becomes a um, issue. But personality can also be a factor. And what I mean by this is if you see this very cute little picture here, the little boy was um, pushing a stroller. He thought it would be funny to fling himself backwards in order to fall. He was pretending that he was slipping on ice. Um, so sometimes personality plays a role in this, but you'll be able to decipher whether your kiddo is being um, silly or not. Very much in clinic, I can tell that a kid has um, been doing a jump and then two jumps later, he's all of a sudden throwing his arms up and as though the world has shifted under his feet. That's when personality plays a role in this trip and fall. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. I think I'm right on time, 12 minutes to spare for questions. If you guys have any questions about the presentation, footwear, anything like that, physio in general, please feel free. Thank you so much, Kasha. That was really, really insightful. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions. We do have a few to go through. Um, I know you touched on these kind of briefly in your um, frequently asked questions, but we'll see if there's anything else you want to add. So Chris asks, what, when you talk about no dominance between sides, does this mean no preference as well? For example, if you ask them to stand on one foot and they always choose the left foot, does that matter? Very good question. Um, so the answer is yes and no. Um, so yes, preference and dominance are very important distinctions that we want to make. So kids can be dominant in the side of they're always using one side. So that's when dominance becomes a factor. They might have a preferred way of moving so long as things are symmetric. So if you ask them to use the opposite side of their body and they can do it for the same amount of time with the same quality, then that preference is totally fine. Um, but typically a preference and dominance go together. Okay, great. Um, so David asks about W sits. I know we talked about that already, but he says specifically, my child is two and a half and she still W sits occasionally. We've worked on butt sitting and knee sitting, but she'll still default to the W sitting. Uh, we haven't noticed any tripping or tiptoeing to date. Anything we should be worried about? Great question. So W sitting is this tricky one and there's tons of information online about W sitting. W sitting can be based on multiple different things. So your little one might actually have more movement in their hips where their hips can go inward. So going into that W position is just an automatic or preferred position because it's easier for them to get into. If it's not impacting development, if they're able to get out of it within 10 minutes, they have different ways of sitting, then it's an okay position. They might just have to work through different types of strengthening. So working on using their butt cheeks a little bit more. As they get older, they will grow out of this. They'll be sitting in chairs more often. They won't have an opportunity to be on the floor. So two and a half years old, I'm not overly concerned if you're not seeing any delays in development. 
it just might be the structure of their bones that makes it easy. Okay, that makes sense. Um, David asks, can you send out the presentation for reference? I can answer that one. Yes, we will be sending out the full webinar for everyone after the session, which will include the presentation slides that Kasia went through today. And some more information just on um, the website for Toronto Physio and all, all that. Um, okay, the next question is from Holly. She says, could you please discuss toe walking again and whether it is a concern? My four-year-old still does this. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love the question of toe walking all the time because there's so many, like I said, there's so many causes or reasons. Like I mentioned, if they've been doing this greater than four to six months, um, and they've definitely started toe walking since they began walking, I would say go just check it out with a physio. Their muscles might be tight. It might be a sensory issue. Um, even though it should self-resolve itself, like I had said in the presentation, earlier intervention for any of this stuff is better than waiting. If you come in to see a physio and they say nothing is wrong, peace of mind. But if you're waiting for quite some time, now they've spent four years walking on their toes, it's just going to be harder to change. Not that we can't. Um, but I think I would say, look to see how long they've been toe walking for. Um, if it's been since they started walking, definitely come see a physio. Can they stand flat footed? Um, and can they do things flat footed? And is it impacting their balance? If you answer yes to impacting balance and always toe walking since they were born, I would seek out some support. Wonderful. Um, okay, so Jessica asks, what are some common things you see toddlers come in for around the ages of one to two years of age? And should when what should we look out for? Yeah, um, so that's, I know I said I love working on jumping, but outside of that, my under two, I say, would be my favorite thing to treat. So I run a early walkers class for 12 to 18 months. So for the first kind of six months, we're working on just navigating surfaces. So being able to step up and off of the surface over something, turning around things. So really navigating the environment is huge for one to two years of age. Um, and then again, like I'd mentioned, being able to explore their environment. So trialing stairs, trialing going up and down ramps, going to the playground. Everything is really stability-based those first six months and being able to move around. And then the next six months is gaining strength in new positions. So stairs, jumping, um, catching and throwing and then balance. Okay, great. Uh, so I have another question here from Danny. He says he's concerned about his son's poor balance. He seems to fall theatrically, not on purpose. How old did you say story? Um, there's no age listed. Danny, if you want to write the, your son's age in the chat, please go ahead. 22 months. 22 months. Yeah. Um, so with being 22 months, I think it would be something you have to think about what were they doing before? If they were delayed or they were slow movers in the sense of they really didn't like sitting and going side to side because they were nervous or their balance reactions were off, it might be typical that they're presenting this way. Obviously, we want to make sure that they're not tripping and falling quite a bit. There can be a couple of things that are impacting that. If they're lifting their feet up off of the floor, do they have enough tummy muscles or do they have that cute Buddha belly right now? Um, so I would say if you're concerned, always a great idea to come see a physio. I don't know if most people on this call are from Canada or from the States, but from a Canadian perspective, physio for the most part is covered under health benefits if you have them. Um, so even if you want to do a just check in with your little one, we can always give you suggestions for what's kind of causing the poor balance. Wonderful. That's great advice. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, now is your time. Yes, we have just a few more minutes left before we'll potentially get cut off. Um, and just so you know, I will be sending out, as I mentioned earlier, all the recordings. We'll send a follow up in the next few days. Oh, I have a question here. Uh, my 18th month old fell and couldn't weight bear for one and a half days. Is walking now, but injured foot is turned out. Is this a good opportunity to see someone like you? Yeah, absolutely. So we see lots of different kiddos, whether they fell and fractured their leg, whether they fell and injured themselves, sometimes with little ones, um, they don't want to put down that injured foot because they're a little bit scared. It might hurt or they might think it's going to hurt. 
Um, and because of that, the turning out of that foot means they, if they don't have their toes pointing forward, they go outward to gain themselves a little bit more balance. So they might just be a little bit nervous. Um, so it's a great opportunity to get some tips and tricks on working on alignment or getting them more comfortable with shifting towards that injured leg. Great. Um, all right, another one here. My two and a half year old seems to drag one foot when walking. Should I be concerned? <laughs> I love all these questions about should I be concerned? I always feel bad saying yes and no. So it's something that we, I can't answer in the sense of, I don't know why it's happening. Um, it's not something you don't have to be concerned about from, is it gonna be the end of the world for them? No. Um, however, if it is asymmetric, obviously we don't want any dominance, especially not under the age of three. So it's something good to just look into. They might've slept towards one side as an infant. They might've started walking towards one side or cruising as a little baby. So as kids grow up, Sometimes, like I mentioned, their bones grow faster than their muscles. So they might be going through a growth spurt and one side tends to kind of work a little harder than the other side. So it'd be something to check out, but not necessarily that you have to be overly concerned about. See what happens over the next four weeks. And if things don't change, then you can always reach out. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Kasha. I think that's the end of our questions here. Um, I will send the follow up within the next few days and thank you so much for your for your help and for everyone's participation. That was really great. Thank you so much for having me guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye everyone. <laughs>